Recently, the judge released the probable cause affidavit of Richard Allen in the Delphi case. There were witnesses on the trail that day. They saw Richard Allen, or who's believed to be Richard Allen, and Richard Allen even admits to being there. So today we're gonna go through the document, I've organized it, and we're going to do a little deep dive. Now there were only eight pages, so I am questioning as to how many pages there actually were, and I'm questioning if that was the final a copy, so to say, that we, the public, received. So now, let's get into it. I will be reading from the document and paint a bigger picture. One of the things that was interesting, of course it was redacted, but there was the detective names that were redacted. I can understand the witnesses' names, but I found that interesting. And it doesn't show who actually signed the probable cause affidavit, which I find is interesting as well. Let me know what you think below. And to me, like I said in the beginning of this video, that it seems like there's missing pages or we were giving a dummy copy. I'll get to that in a minute, but first let's dive into the document. So first it begins by saying that on February 14th, 2017, victim one and victim two were found deceased in the woods approximately 0.2 miles northeast of the Monon High Bridge in Carroll County. Their bodies were located on the north side of Deer Creek. Now victim one is said to be Abby and victim two is Libby. So they first map out the area. They talk about Monon High Bridge, then Freedom Bridge, which is just northwest of Monon, and the Old State Road, aka County Road 300 North. They gathered evidence through interviews, reviews of electronic records, and also a review of video at the Hoosier Harvest Store and where that is located. At 1.49 p.m. on February 13th, 2017, we know that Abby and Libby were dropped off across from the Mears Farm by Libby's sister, Kelsey. And the Mears Farm is located on the north side of County Road 300 North near an entrance to the trails. At 2.13 p.m. we know that's when Libby took the video of BG aka Bridge Guy. It says Abby and Libby encountered a male subject on the southeast portion of the Monon High Bridge. The male ordered the girls guys down the hill. No witnesses saw them after this time. No outgoing communications were found on Libby's phone after this time. It does say victim too, but we're gonna replace that with Libby. Their bodies were discovered on February 14, 2017. It says here, the video recovered from Libby's phone shows Abby walking southeast on the Monon High Bridge while a male subject wearing a dark jacket and jeans walks behind her. That's new, right? As the male subject approaches Abby and Libby, one of the victims mentions gun. Near the end of the video, a male is seen and heard telling the girls guys down the hill. The girls then begin to proceed down the hill and the video ends. This is interesting. I have a couple points to make. Why does the video end right there? Was it a slip of, you know, the uh, Libby's thumb that she stopped videoing? Was it that he saw the actual phone being recorded? We were under the impression that that video that Libby took was 43, I think they said 43 seconds long. We only got a little clip, but for some reason it felt like it was the more the beginning that they did that rather than towards the end of the video. So it's interesting to know what the heck is on the rest of that video. But in the probable cause affidavit, all they need to do is really just show that they have enough to nab the guy. They're not gonna, you know, spill everything and what they know in this, but I do find it interesting. And I do wonder, does the audio still go and then the video meaning just, you know, they can't see it, it's actually in her pocket. Really would love to know what you guys think, let me know below. It says a still photograph taken from the video and the guys down the hill audio was subsequently released to the public to assist investigators in identifying the male. And of course, Abby and Libby's deaths were ruled as homicides. There were clothes found in the Deer Creek belonging to Abby and Libby south of where the bodies were located. In previous video, I think it's the first video I did in my playlist that Libby's sister Kelsey ended up having, well, somebody with her, I guess, who was searching for Abby and Libby found one of their shoes and it ends up being Libby's shoe. And they did talk in the Ron Logan release, it was in my Ron Logan video, that the perpetrator actually took some clothing with him or them. It says there was also a 40 caliber unspent round less than two feet away from Libby's body and between Abby and Libby's bodies. The round was unspent and had extraction marks on it. We're going to get to that bullet and have a chit chat about that in a minute. 
let's go into the actual witnesses. It said that there were three juvenile female witnesses and then a few more. And I believe there was a total of four females. What's weird and hard to, to figure out in here is that there's a blank, right? They redacted the names. So you're trying to piece this together, but I think I got a little bit clear picture, not entirely of who everybody is, but I did my best. So these three juveniles and one other person, so a total of four is what I believe, they were on the Monon Bridge Trail that day, February 13th. They were walking on the trail towards Freedom Bridge to go home when they encountered a male walking from Freedom Bridge toward Monon. And then it says the witness one, okay, witness one described the male as kind of creepy and advised he was wearing like blue jeans and like a really light blue jacket and he, his hair was gray, maybe a little brown and he did not really show his face, quote unquote. She advised the jacket was a duck canvas type jacket. Number two witness said that she said hi to the male, but j he just glared at them. She recalled him being in, a bl in all black and had something covering his mouth. She described him as not very tall with a bigger build. She said he was not bigger than five foot 10. And we know, I think his actual height is around five foot five. Correct me if I'm wrong in the comments below. Lots and lots of info to remember. Number three, witness advised he was wearing a black hoodie, black jeans, and black boots. She stated he had his hands in his pockets. We saw BG on the bridge do that. Number four witness showed investigators photos she took on her phone on the trail that day, which includes a photo of Monon High Bridge taken at 12.43 p.m. and another one taken at 1.26 p.m. of the bench east of the Freedom Bridge. After she took a photo of the bench, they started walking back toward Freedom Bridge. She said that's when she encountered the man who matched the description of the photo that was taken from Libby's video. And the witness described the man on the trails wearing a blue or black windbreaker jacket. She said the jacket had a collar and he had his hood up from the clothing underneath his jacket. She advised he was wearing baggy jeans and was taller than her. She advised her head came up to approximately his shoulder. She said hi to the man and he said nothing back. She stated he was walking with a purpose like he knew where he was going. He had his hands in his pockets and kept his head down. She did not get a good look at his face but believed him to be a white male. The girls advised after encountering the male, they continued their walk across Freedom Bridge and the old railroad bridge over Old State Road 25. There was another witness in this document that was on the trails that day. It says a video from the Hoosier Harvest Store captured blank vehicle traveling eastbound at 1.46 p.m. toward the entrance across from the Mears Farm, which is the same area, remember, as where Libby and Abby were dropped off. This witness saw four juvenile females walking on the bridge over Old State Road 25 as she was driving underneath on her way to park. She said no other cars parked across from the Mears Farm when she parked. She walked to the Monon High Bridge and saw a male matching the one from Libby's video. She described him as a white male wearing blue jeans and a blue jean jacket. She said he was standing on the first platform of the Monon High Bridge approximately 50 feet from her and around halfway between the bridge and the parking area across from Mears Farm she passed two girls walking toward Monon High Bridge. She believed those girls were Abby and Libby. It says video from the Hoosier Harvest Store shows at 1.49 p.m. a white car matching a vehicle traveling away from the entrance across from the trail. When this witness was leaving, she noted a vehicle was parked in an odd manner at the old Child Protective Services building. She said it wasn't odd for vehicles to be parked there, but noticed it was odd because of the way it was parked backed in near the building. Obviously, when some people put back in, you can't see the license plate. More about this car at the building. It says investigators received a tip from blank, which he stated he was on his way to Delphi on State Road 25 at around 2.10 p.m. on February 13th. He saw a purple PT Cruiser or small SUV type vehicle parked on the south side of the old CPS building. He stated it appeared as though it was backed in as to conceal the license plate of the vehicle. Both witnesses drew diagrams of where the vehicle was parked and it says in the document they generally matched as to the area the vehicle was parked and the manner in which it was parked. Blank advised he remembered seeing a smaller dark colored park car at the old CPS building and described it as possibly being a smart car. Blank's vehicle is seen leaving at 2.28 p.m. on video. Now there was another witness that said 
that she traveled east on 300 north on February 13th, 2022, which is a typo. And it said she observed a male walking west on the north side of 300 north away from the Monon High Bridge. He wore a blue colored jacket and blue jeans and was muddy and bloody. It appeared he had gotten into a fight. It says investigators were able to determine from watching the video from the Hoosier Harvest Store that Blank was traveling on CR 300 North at approximately 3.57 p.m. Then it goes on to say that there were other people on the trail that were interviewed, but they didn't encounter BG and they didn't see Abby and Libby either. Now here's where it gets very interesting and we got to have a little deeper talk about this. It says this about Richard Allen, quote, Investigators reviewing prior tips encountered a tip narrative from an officer who interviewed Richard M. Allen in 2017. I mentioned that in my last video that it was said he was a witness. It says the narrative stated, Mr. Allen was on the trail between 1.30 to 3.30 p.m. He parked at the Old Farm Bureau building and walked to the New Freedom Bridge. In the document, it states, investigators believe Mr. Allen was referring to the former Child Protective Services building as there was not a Farm Bureau building in the area, nor had there been. Now, why would Richard, who has been living in Delphi since 2006, call it the Old Farm Bureau building if it's never been called that? And why would Richard park there? if he was just going for a leisurely park. I mean, there's a couple parking spots or parking areas that I'm aware of, and that's interesting to me. Also, he would know it was abandoned, obviously, but how ironic is it, or maybe it was on purpose, that he parks at this Child Protective Services building when these two children needed protecting. It's just chilling. And it says in a later interview, he said that he parked his car on the side of an old building. So he was interviewed twice about this. One of them was voluntary, which was interesting, but we'll get to that in a minute. Now about his cars. So in 2017, Richard owned two vehicles, a 2016 black Ford Focus and a 2006 gray Ford 500. It says investigators saw a vehicle that looked like Richard's Ford Focus on the Hoosier Harvest Store video at 1.27 p.m. traveling westbound on CR 300 North in front of the Hoosier Harvest Store, which coincided with his statement that he arrived around 1.30 p.m. at the trail. So he's saying, yeah, I was at the trails from 1.30 to 3.30. And they go on to say witnesses noted the vehicle parked as a PT Cruiser, small SUV, or smart car. You can see here the differences in the vehicles. Now, Richard says while he was at the Freedom Bridge, he saw the three females, which corroborates the witnesses' statements. He noted one was taller and had brown or black hair. He did not remember description nor did he speak with them, which again corroborates what they said. Document states, investigators believe the females he saw included blank and blank due to the time they were leaving the trail, the time he reported getting to the trail, and the descriptions the three females gave. In a second interview on October 13th, which is the day that they did the search warrant, he said he saw juvenile girls on the trails east of Freedom Bridge and that he went on to the Monon High Bridge. He said he went to watch the fish. Just a little side note this bridge is 63 feet up in the air so I don't know what he means by watch the fish and what kind of half-assed alibi is that you're gonna go watch the fish you had six years legit six years almost six years I should say but a good portion of time and you came up that you're gonna watch the fish why didn't you just say you're watching paint dry although I'm wondering if it's a play on words and I'll tell you why and we'll circle back. He says he walked from the Freedom Bridge to the High Bridge. He did not see anybody, although he said while he was walking, he was watching a stock ticker on his phone. WTF is that, honestly. Like, I thought about this and I thought, hmm, stock ticker. And for those of you who don't know, you know, you see the news, you see the stock market and it just kind of slides by like a rolling marquee. That's a stock ticker pretty much. And I don't know if he trades stocks, that'd be interesting to know. But I'm wondering if that's a play on words as well. Like watch the fish. I thought, oh my gosh, this is that has to do with catfishing. It could be nothing. But honestly, why would you say such a stupid thing? You, you went to go watch the fish. And then he says he was watching the stock ticker on his phone. He volunteered that information to the authorities. And then I thought, oh, what, because time is ticking? Either that or did he have GPS in his hand and was watching where these girls are? Because now think about this for a minute. You have Abby and Libby who are juveniles. And then you had the other juveniles he already passed. So 
it seems, and I would think, those girls are targeted specifically, which doesn't look good for Richard Allen, but it does seem like that because he had an opportunity of three other juvenile girls, why not them, right? That's my argument. Let me know your thoughts below. He says, later in his statement, he said he walked out to the first platform on the bridge, which corroborates again the other witness. He said he then walked back, sat on a bench on the trail and then left. He also reiterated he didn't see anyone else except the juvenile girls he saw east of the Freedom Bridge. And then they talk about his cell phone. His cell phone did not list an identifier, but did add the following and then a bunch of serial numbers, which is an identifier for his phone. But now here's where I was wondering about the rough copy. Take a look at this. It says, potential follow-up information. Who were the three girls walking in the area of Freedom Bridge? Why would you have that in an official document that's the probable cause document that you would uh, be submitting? Wouldn't that's a note to self type of thing and wouldn't that already be done? I don't know, that bothers me. What are your thoughts? Also, it's in a weird font, just my opinion. Now, when it comes to what he wore, Richard admits it. He says he was wearing blue jeans and a blue or black Carhartt jacket with a hood. Yeah, he knew what he was wearing, in my opinion. Also, he said he may have been wearing some type of head covering as well. And the sketches were released and the video, I think it was only a few days after this. Um, I think the video was only a few days after, only they just said down the hill, not guys. It was just down the hill. Then they added guys later, which is like a half a second. In my one of my last videos or a couple videos ago, I showed you a picture or I should say a video of his wife videoing Richard and he was wearing what looked like kind of the blue jacket that BG wore on the bridge and that day. And he also said to the authorities, yeah, he owns firearms, they're at the house. His wife confirmed that Richard had guns and knives at the house, which is interesting that had guns and knives at the house. Also, she said that Richard still owns a blue Carhartt jacket. Now, this is another thing. I mean, why did he keep the jacket for kicks? He's kind of like that, right? Did they find, did they find the underwear or the missing uh, garments belonging to Abby and Libby or, or, and, or? It kind of strikes me because of everything that's we're finding out about Richard, like he was, you know, hiding in plain sight and he gave free pictures to the family and just weird things, taking a picture, you know, in front of his uh, mugshot, I guess, or not his mugshot, in front of the uh, wanted ad so to speak. It's interesting. I'm wondering if he kept it because I saw profilers talking to that he may not have committed another crime after this because he's still getting, you know, kicks off of what he, you know, what he allegedly did. It says this in the search warrant, it says among other items found, just curious what those are. It says jackets were found, boots, knives, and firearms, including a Sig Sauer. Hopefully I say that right. I'm not a gun person. Uh, Model P22640 caliber pistol with serial number, blah, blah, blah. And he bought it in 2001. Now, I got to bring this up too because it's interesting because I was thinking, oh, what about the Evansdale? When was that? Which was in 2012, July 13th. And then it's February 13th that the girls were murdered. At 2.13 is when Abby had that picture, and I'm, I just, it's kind of creepy in a way that's like 2.13, 2.13, and then July 13th, these Evansdale, which is really interesting. And there was actually a couple days before that there was a full moon, now some people don't believe in it, but it is really weird around the full moon how people go a little, a little bat, you know what, crazy. I've said this before with paramedics, nurses, doctors, they all kind of, and police officers, Things get crazy bananas at the hospitals and the jails because people seem to go a little bit, you know, the things happen. And a lot of times around this full moon, there's been a lot of murders, just saying. So between October 14th and October 19th, they did analysis made on Richard's gun, which remember October 13th was the search warrant. They went and confiscated a bunch of stuff. And then from the 14th to the 19th, they did that. It says. They did a physical examination and classification of the firearm. They did a function test. They did a barrel and overall length measurement, test firing, ammunition component characterization, microscopic comparison, and an NIBIN, which is a National Integrated Ballistic Information Network. The lab determined the unspent round found within two feet of Libby and between Abby and Libby cycled through Richard's gun. Now there's been no cause of death released yet in the deaths of Abby and Libby. 
but it was said that there was a lot of blood. So were the girls shot in something else or what the heck happened? And also, let's talk about this bullet. Was he taunting? I, I bring this up because it feels like with all the weird things and maybe some, you know, play on words like Chad Daybell and half of the other ones, was he taunting the cops? I mean, why would there be a bullet unspent on the ground? Wouldn't he cover his tracks? Or was he kind of brazen and knew about it and was like, yeah, beat that. I'm just going to call in and call myself a witness. I'm going to be safe. Or was he ignorant to the ballistics? I find that weird that he would be ignorant to that. I think a lot of people would just know like, yeah, that, that this stuff can be traced. Let me know what you think below. The lab's comments about this, it says, an identification opinion is reached when the evidence exhibits an agreements of class characteristics and a sufficient agreement of individual marks. Sufficient agreement is related to the significant duplication of random striated slash impressed marks as evidenced by the correspondence of a pattern or combination of patterns or of surface contours. The interpretation of identification is subjective in nature and based on relevant scientific research and the reporting examiner's training and experience. Now on October 26th, which is the day he was taken into custody and two weeks after the search warrant, Richard voluntarily went to the Indiana State Police. He told investigators he never allowed anyone to borrow his gun or use his gun. When he was asked about the unspent bullet, Richard didn't have an explanation of why the bullet was found between Abby and Libby. Oh, what was it, the fish? He again admitted he was on the trail but denied knowing Abby or Libby or any involvement in their murder. So he had six years to figure out what the reason is why there would be an unspent bullet. Or did he not know? Or is he just innocent and it was somebody else? that happened to have the same gun, Richard's gun. And I remember in the Ronald Logan leak, that had some stuff that talked about fibers, they talked about other stuff, so uh, it's interesting. I believe that there's more than just a gun in this, in this case. Now the detectives were redacted, like I said, which is weird, but maybe because of the judge and all that stuff that went on. It says the detective believes he, the evidence gathered shows that Richard Allen is the man seen on Libby's phone and who forced them down the hill. Also that they were led to the location where they were murdered by Richard Allen. Then there was a summary in the documents and it says through the statements of the juvenile females and the statement of blank and blank were at the southeast edge of the trail at 1243 p.m east of Freedom Bridge at 1.26 p.m. And then they walked across the former railroad overpass, it says, over Old State Road 25 after 1.26 and before 1.46. They walked the entirety of the trail and observed only one person, an adult male. Blank vehicle is seen on Hoosier Harvest Store video at 1.46 and leaving at 2.14 and she stated she saw only one adult male. Blank and Blank described the male in similar manners, wearing similar clothing, leading investigators to believe all four saw the same male individual, which just so happens to be the same thing that Richard Allen said he was wearing and where he was going and what he was doing, and it all corroborates. It says investigators believe the male observed by Blank and Blank is the same male depicted in the video from Libby's phone due to the descriptions of the male by the four females matching the male in the video. Furthermore, Libby's video was taken at 2.13 p.m. and Blank saw only one male while she was on the trail from approximately 1.46 to 2.14. Investigators believe Richard Allen was the male seen by Blank and Blank and the male seen in Libby's video. Richard told investigators he was on the trail from 1.30 to 3.30 p.m. that day, maybe a little fib. Video from the Hoosier Harvest Store shows a vehicle that matches the description of Richard's vehicle passing at 1.27 p.m. And then about the CPS building. It says the clothing he told investigators matched the clothing of the male in Libby's video and the clothing descriptions provided by the witnesses. A vehicle matching the description of the 2016 Ford Focus is seen at or around 210, 214, and 228 at the CPS building. Throughout his own admissions, Richard Allen walked the trails and eventually hiked to Monon High Bridge and walked out onto the Monon High Bridge. And Libby had a video of him walking behind. A male subject matching Richard Allen's description was not seen on the trail after 213. Investigators identified other individuals and then talking about the time between 2.30 and 4.11, none of those individuals saw a male subject matching Richard. So that was after 
uh, 2.13 p.m. after that video, and it says, investigators believe Richard Allen was not seen on the trail after 2.13 because he was in the woods with Abby and Libby. Unspent 40 caliber round between Abby and Libby was forensically determined to have been cycled through Richard's gun. The gun was found at Richard's home, and he admitted owning it, and investigators determined he owned it since 2001. Richard stated he'd not been on the property where the unspent round was found, and that he did not know the property owner, and that he had no explanation as to why a round cycled through his firearm would be at that location, which is Ron Logan's farm. So what do you think? Was it an accident that this bullet was on the ground and he left it? Or did he leave it there? Or wouldn't he have been smarter? Or because maybe he's a daredevil, he liked to push the envelope a little bit. I don't know. Also, remember he stated he never let anyone use his gun or borrow it. it. says, investigators believe that after the victims were murdered, Richard Allen returned to his vehicle by walking down CR 300 North. Investigators believe he was seen by Blank walking back to his vehicle on CR 300 North with clothes that were muddy and bloody. Blank, along with investigators, believe the statement made by the witnesses because the statements corroborate the timeline of the death of two victims as well as coincide with the admissions made by Richard Allen. Further, the accounts related by Blank and Blank are similar in nature and timestamps on photographs taken by Blank correspond to the times that juvenile females said they were on the trail and saw the male individual. So the question I have is how did these girls die? There is a gag order now. Everybody has to zip their lip until January 13th, but it ends there, the document. There's no uh, a signature there. There's nothing. This is why I'm wondering how many more pages are there in it? And did we just get like a modified good enough version? I don't know. This is this is kind of weird to me from the ones that I've seen before, but they only need to, you know, show probable cause. They just have to show enough to, you know, to uh, bust his butt. And one more thing I'm curious about because he admitted to looking at his phone. Why are there no pings? And maybe there are, but why no mention of, you know, the authorities determined that you know, they couldn't get pings or a location on his phone or they could or it was turned off or anything like there was a z zero. Maybe again, because they don't have to, but I would think that they would say something about the pings because he mentioned the phone that, you know, authorities determined that the phone was in the area such and such time. I find it interesting what is missing from this document. Apparently this, there was a clerical error and that's why they missed this tip. Doug Carter did say that now they're going through every single tip all over again. But apparently the FBI did look into it and the person who was doing the tips did everything right, but something happened and it slipped. I'll have to uh, find that little information because I don't remember in totality. So it's pretty eerie to think that this place was scoped before. He knew where he was going. He's been there for years. He lived there since 2006. We saw his daughter take a picture of there. I wonder if that was on the 13th. Anybody know that? Let me know. Now, if you want to check out my other videos on the case, you can check it out here. Please subscribe if you haven't done so already. Please share this out. Thank you so much for watching. We'll see you soon.